All right. So Dr. Florian, thank you so much for joining the YouTube channel and the Total Knee Replacement Support Group. My name is Tony Maritato. For those of you who don't know me, I am a physical therapist, but this segment is all about Dr. Florian. He is located in Texas. I'm going to let him introduce himself, and he's going to be talking to us about what you see here on the screen, robotically assisted, minimally invasive total knee replacement. So Dr. Florian, please introduce yourself for those of us who don't know you. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is uh, a really fun session for me every time we get together and be able to talk about uh, knee topics and uh, how we can help our patients. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today, and I'll, I'll introduce myself in a second, I have a slide for that, uh, is we're going to talk about minimally invasive robotically assisted total knee replacement. However, I, I will touch base a little bit what knee pain is and what knee arthritis is and what other options we do have. It's not always surgery. And, uh, a lot of times uh, we can help our patients uh, without surgery and make them feel better. And so I'll touch briefly on that and then uh, focus on the surgical side of things, which I know a lot of folks have, have gone through or are thinking about going through. Uh, and so let's see if I can just control the slides. And so we'll, the outline again, will be going over the knee pain diagnosis and treatment. Uh, so just a brief uh, introduction for myself. Uh, my name is Florian Deber. I'm a, a fellowship trained uh, orthopedic surgeon. I specialized in hip and knee replacements. I did my residency training and my fellowship training at the University of Florida. And uh, I, I couldn't think of a better place to uh, get my surgical training in hip and knee replacement than a retirement capital of the United States. So uh, we had a we had a great time and a great experience, and currently I am located in the um, uh, North Dallas uh, area in Frisco, Texas, um, at the Orthopedic Institute of North Texas. So just a bit of introduction: osteoarthritis. Uh, it's a very common uh, disease in the United States. About 35 million U.S. adults affected by this, and knee arthritis is more common than hip arthritis, about two to one ratio. And females are more commonly affected than males, and uh, this is a huge cost. Uh, uh, over seven billions annually uh, on just the surgical cost, let alone the non-surgical stuff that is uh, even higher than that. And so what is knee arthritis? And you have here a depiction uh, what uh, anatomically a normal knee looks like. And so you have the femur, which is the top thigh bone and the tibia, which is the bottom or the shin bone. And then you have in this uh, light gray, the cartilage and the darker blue, it's the menisci, these little C-shaped structures. And you got the ligaments, the ACL, the PCL in the middle and the ligaments on the side. And all these together, this is a kneecap in the front, all these together make your knee. And then with time, what happens is this cartilage or this light, uh, you know, gray, white area turns into bone. And, and that's sometimes, you know, people have that misconception of like, oh, my cartilage uh, disappeared or went away. And so to get a little technical uh, from a science standpoint, matter doesn't disappear, it sort of transforms it to something. So uh, cartilage actually transforms into bone. And that's the reason why you have all these bone spurs or or osteophytes, and that's the reason why you get this narrowing of the joint spaces because you're putting down uh, more bone. And then you also, as you lose this uh, space narrowing, you start loosening, uh, losing the tension on the ligaments on the side. And that's the reason why you start having some shifting on the bones. And that's why I'll, some patients say, I have instability, my knee is giving out, I need to wear a brace. And that's, that's sort of what's happening. It's so the bracing, and I'll talk about it a little later, is taking over the role of these ligaments on the side to give your knee some stability so it's not constantly rubbing and hurting you. So how does it present in my patients? Obviously, pain is the number one uh, symptom that we see patients in our office. It's worse in the morning and after long periods of sitting. And I have patients that tell me, well, after a while, after I get going on my bicycle or my walks, I actually feel better. So that's typically the pattern. It's just when you first get, get up and walk, that's where it hurts the most. Uh, it starts getting stiff, you start losing a little bit of range of motion and it starts getting swollen. And then ultimately, as you start losing that height and you start getting subluxation and, and motion in your knee, you get this deformity, which is again, it's a lace symptoms. And 85% of patients get uh, arthritis on the inside of their knee, that's why they become bow-legged. And 15% uh, get, loosen, or, uh, get uh, loss of height on the outside of the knee and get what's called a knock knee or a valgus deformity. Um, so for the hip, and I, this was a talk that I given prior, also the knee, but just for the, for the knee standpoint, it's not always arthritis. Uh, we're going to focus our talk on arthritis today, but it's, it could be other things, right? So it could be the other in, uh, structures inside the knee. So I mentioned the meniscus, so the meniscus could have a tear. Uh, you can have ligamentous injury. A lot of times what knee sprain, when you hear about knee sprain, that's essentially a ligamentous uh, sprain. It's typically the medial collateral ligament or the ligament on the inside of the knee. You can have inflammation of the tendons around your knee. 
Um, you can have inflammation of the bursa. There's a bunch of fluid filled sacs around the knee that cause uh, that basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to provide cushion around your knee. And we have them on our elbows, we have them on our shoulders, we have them on the side of our hip. And that those fluid filled sacs can get inflamed. That's called bursitis. And you can have other diseases that cause inflammation inside the knee, rheumatoid arthritis being one of them. You can have trauma, especially in the elderly population, which is what I see when I step off a curb and it gets tremendous knee pain. That's, that's actually fractured. They get little tiny fractures underneath the joint line. And I get to see those with MRIs uh, oftentimes. And then very rarely you get this lack of oxygen or vascular necrosis that I see some folks with steroid use or heavy alcohol use. So you can see this, this is an x-ray, basically how we diagnose knee pain. And, and luckily almost 90 some percent of the time on just simple x-rays, we can get to the bottom of, a, of the cause here, which is nice because it's a quick imaging study and it's inexpensive. And so on the left here, you can see what a normal joint space looks like on the inside of the knee and the outside of the knee. And this is, this is that space. Again, the space is made of cartilage and the meniscus on the side. And then you can see here when you've lost that space and you've had that shifting of the bones, you can see there's no space anymore. And then sometimes when, when the x-rays are inconclusive and they're still having a lot of pain, I do tend to rely on MRIs. And you can see here, this black structure right here, it's the meniscus. And a solid black is a good sign versus when it has white lines inside of it, that's a, that's, that's a tear. And so you can see here, this particular patient had a meniscal tear. And sometimes when I mentioned uh, um, uh, folks with uh, weak bones sometimes can fall and they can cause fracture. They get fractures in this area here and this area here. This bone is a little softer than the mid portion of our bone. So the bone at the end is a little softer. So sometimes it gets mushed when you fall and it can hurt. And of course, sometimes I get CT scan, but that's typically in traumas when they really have fallen. And you can see the changes anyway on x-ray, but this is more for surgical planning. You can get a CT scan. But the majority of our, of, of our diagnosis is just x-ray, which is very uh, uh, inexpensive and quick. So what is the treatment of, of a knee pain caused by arthritis, which is, again, what this talk is mostly about? Well, it depends on the diagnosis, it depends on the severity, and it depends on the patient, right? So I have patients that have uh, really advanced arthritis, bone on bone, and the patient says, well, my pain is not uh, that high, doc. It's very uh, well managed with the ice pack and anti-inflammatory, and, and I'm okay with that. So it, all, it depends on the patient quite often, what they would like to do. And we all have grading systems, and anything in orthopedics has a grading system. So going from the left to the right, what normal knee looks like and, and, and a grade one to a grade four, which is advanced arthritis, bone on bone, subluxation or bone shifting one, uh, the top bone versus the bottom bone. And so the treatment options for me is non-surgical, non-surgical, non-surgical. You know, I'm a surgeon, you know, obviously operating, I love to operate. However, majority of my patients can be made better with non-surgical treatment. This is the reason why we offer this uh, first uh, because surgery while great, uh, it still has uh, side effects and uh, risks and, and so uh, we were cognizant of that. So activity modification, one of the first thing we do, so avoid high impact activities. So if my patient is doing a lot of running or playing a lot of basketball, a lot of jumping, I say, well, it's time to uh, modif modify those activities. You know, there's plenty of other ways of staying active and enjoying uh, hobbies, um, swimming, low impact because of water, um, uh, stationary bikes, uh, elliptical. If you want to go to the gym and do something like that, you can use the elliptical, not the treadmill. Um, so those are some of the things they can still do uh, long walks and hikes. That's all fine. And then weight loss. I talk about that. I know it's difficult. A lot of surgeons don't do a very good job of talking about the patients about weight or they don't put it in the, in, in, in the right uh, context. But I, I spend some time and I, I talk to them and I tell them that for every pound of weight loss, um, it's essentially a four pound reduction on the knee, especially. And so we go over like nutrition options and, you know, just spending time with them, they appreciate that because, you know, most folks get the, get the uh, opinion that they're just being told that they're overweight and they're being brushed off. But if you really take your time, sit down with a patient, and talk to them and, and tell them how, how you could be done, you know, 500 calories a day uh, reduction for a week, that's a pound weight loss you just did for, your, for yourself. And so they put it in context for them and given them option, they understand that because no one had the time to uh, talk to them about that. And then we talk about anti-inflammatories because this is an inflammatory process. This is inflammation. This is pain. So using medication to suppress that can help. And obviously a lot of over-the-counter stuff or prescription strength like minoxicam and naproxen, they help. And then Tylenol is a pain reliever, especially the extra strength of the Tylenol arthritis. It's actually 650 versus the Tylenol extra strength is 500. And so we have to be cautious not to go over about three grams or so a day. That's the new guidelines. And then there's also ointment as well, the Voltaren gel, which is now over-the-counter. Um, there's other prescription uh, gel types, but this is an over-the-counter one that uh, patients can get very easily. 
So physical therapy, obviously, uh, a lot of the folks tuning in and listening to Anthony, and this is a great resource. I, I utilize physical therapy almost on every patient, either if they need surgery or not surgery, we talk about physical therapy all the time, either to address their mild to moderate arthritis or to prepare them for surgery after uh, uh, their surgery, or also even prepare them for surgery even before surgery. So I do what's called prehab and get them as strong as you can. And so I talk about this because a lot of folks, again, they say, well, I'm, I'm active doctor. I don't need my physical therapist. I, I'm okay. I can do my exercise. I can work out. Well, you know, you need to work out in a certain way to address the issues that you're having. So again, we talked about how arthritis leads to stiffness and stiffness leads to pain. So a lot of times stiffness is actually what's causing some of that pain because they're not able to achieve those range of motion. So working on that range of motion, getting those ligaments going, it will help before surgery, it will help out the surgery. So that's important. And then muscle strengthening. So we talked about we lose height when we have arthritis and we start subluxing. Those ligaments on the side get loose. And so the whole top bone is moving. And we have a lot of muscles around our, our bones to basically take over. So this is a ligament here and this is a tendon. So when the ligaments are not doing their job, they're getting loose and the subluxation of the top bone and the bottom bone is happening. Now we're starting to rely on the extra structures outside of that. Uh, layer, which is again, the muscles and the tendons. So by strengthening these areas, these, these muscles around it, you're it's acting like an internal brace is what I tell them. And so it's very, very important that they do that. And I have a lot of patients that say, well, physical therapy was amazing. I, I feel great. It's an internal brace. And then of course we have the external brace and you can see a sample here. When you're narrowed on the inside, you can put a brace that pushes you over here and opens up that space. And this is what it looks like after they've applied the brace that uh, basically opens up that space and now you got space, you're putting more weight on the other side. And this is another way of patients getting great relief. And these are called offloader bracing uh, because it's offloading one side of the knee versus the other. Then we have the injections. And again, you can spend a whole talk on this and I'm just gonna be very brief that some of the options for injections, you have steroid, which again is an anti-inflammatory. So if this is an inflammation, using an anti-inflammatory medication makes sense and it helps. And that's why that's my number one go-to. And of course, you have the gel, which again, I try to tell my patients, it's hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is sort of a backbone to cartilage, but it does not regenerate your cartilage. It doesn't rebuild your cartilage, doesn't heal your cartilage. It truly is something gooey and something soft inside your knee that's just providing some lubrication. That's all it really is. But if you have advanced arthritis and a lot of inflammation, a lot of my patients are not really helped by this. And then you, you may have heard or seen what's called platelet-rich plasma or stem cells. These are these get to be a little more costly and not as, uh, covered as much by insurance. Uh, and again, it all depends on the severity of, of your situation. And it's, it's, it's hard to, there's really hasn't been any studies, a true randomized control study or, or the Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons really get behind these therapies. Uh, and so I, I don't, personally, I'm more of an evidence-based surgeon. So I sort of stick to some of the other stuff that's been proven. And I don't, I don't particularly use these. However, other patients have, and they really swear by it. And I tell them, look, anything you can try that it's not surgery, anything that you can pay for, go for it. It's pretty low cost, you know, pretty low risk, just unfortunately high cost, but you can try it. It's not surgery, doesn't have the risk of surgery. Give it a shot and see how, how that goes. Um, and then surgery. So in, in this particular case, what we're talking about is we're talking about arthritis, it's knee replacement. And so when it's, for me, it's when all else fails, all the non-operative stuff I just mentioned, and when they're not able to walk, not able to work, unable to join their enjoy their lives, their hobbies. Uh, and then of course the imaging has to make sense. I can't have a patient that says, I'm in tremendous pain and we've, we've sort of ruled out most things and it's just a little mild arthritis and why well, I can't work, I can't enjoy my life, I'm really miserable. I just, unfortunately, I can't proceed with that patient. You know, it really has to make sense with everything else. I mean, I know I, I tell my patients I don't treat x-rays, I treat patients. And, but at the same time, I do need to have some sort of evidence that it is really the knee or, or something else. Otherwise, you're doing the wrong surgery and they're going to come back to you still hurting because it was something else. Maybe their back, maybe their hip or, or something else going on. So the knee, knee x-rays, knee imaging has to make sense because those are the patients that hit home runs and they're very, very happy after a knee replacement. All right, so surgery, uh, replacement. So how are we doing? How are surgeons doing? And this is, this is a uh, Swedish uh, a registry and England backs this up. The Australian registry backs it up. The, Uni the United States registry is a little behind, legs behind. It's only about five or so years old versus these registries are in the 15, 20 plus years. And, and so basically what every number you'll see is anywhere from 15 to 20% of total knee replacements uh, patients are not satisfied with their outcome. And some of those things that sort of highlighted was 
pain, not really getting the function that they wish for. And a lot of them were just literally post-operative ex expectations. And so, you know, of course, you can tease this out a little bit because this is every single patient who had a knee replacement and they're being done by somebody who's high volume, somebody who's fellowship trained, or somebody that's not high volume and somebody who's not a fellowship trained. So, so it, it, this is all commerce. So some of that is it's hard to tease out uh, because they all go into this one registry and they all get this one uh, form, uh, uh, thing to fill out and, and talk about their, their satisfactions and their function and pain. Uh, so it's not 100% uh, fair, but this is again, what we call it about 15 to 20% of patients still do not like their knee replacement. So we're constantly trying to figure out ways of how we can make this better, how we can lower this number. And so what I've sort of coined, and I, I kind of talk about, this is sort of my joint replacement ex experience. And, and it's, for me, it's everything's patient-centered. For me, and goal is to, to cause as minimal pain as possible, uh, to avoid any unnecessary risk to the patient, and, and to cause as minimal of a soft, uh, soft tissue insult as possible, because that's going to lead to fast recovery and fast healing. And then, of course, I can be able to do all this and provide all this and still what's called the same-day surgery, which is, again, something... Uh, uh, so different from what things were five to 10 years ago where patients would spend many days in the hospital. And so how it's actually done. So for me, I sort of break it up into before surgery, during surgery, and after surgery. So in the preoperative phase, you know, I spent a lot of time in education. The reason why I do these talks is the reason why I give a lot of webinars and I talk to my patients. You see here in my office, the models and everything else. We spend so much time going over the anatomy and why this is happening. What's the extra show? What's the MRI show? go over the surgery with models of how do I do actually do the surgery. I have in my hand here my postoperative instructions because it's about setting up expectations so the patient knows exactly what they need to do right afterwards. And setting those expectations is very, very important. Tell them about the bruising, tell them about the swelling, tell them that it's normal to hurt, you know, tell them that it's normal to have pain. You know, I'm, I don't, I'm not sugarcoating anything. I'm just very honest with my patient. I give them prescriptions ahead of time because last thing they want to worry about is when they go home and wear their prescriptions. So when they get all this ahead of time, they get my personal cell phone number, they get to communicate with me directly via text message, via phone call. So then if there's ever any issue or concern or they're not sure what's happening to them, they just get a phone call uh, from me or they've called me and they reach out to me and they, they feel so much better because they're able to speak to their surgeon right away. I get with social worker, I get with case, case manager, I make sure everything's set up. I, we do the surgical planning, we do the anesthesia planning. So everything, we're going into it with a, with a plan all personalized to you, to the patient. And then, so when I talk about the recovery, what really that is, is not bone cutting, right? Once you cut the bone and you put this, the implants and you put cement or press fit, whatever implants you're using, and that's done. This is not a fracture that you have to heal this pain. That, that's done. Really, it's soft tissue, soft tissue, soft tissue. That's really where everybody struggles. That's really where everybody hurts. It's the swelling, it's the bruising, it's the redness, it's the healing of the incision. That's, that's really what all the forum topics that I read about are, all my patients call me about. It's really those things. It's not bone pain, it's just literally everything else. So being able to do what's called minimally invasive makes sense because you're, you're causing some less of this, of this uh, issue as possible. So if we go to the Academy of Orthopedic Surgeon, you go to their website and you say, okay, what is minimally invasive, right? Everybody talks about minimally invasive or MIS. Well, what is it? You know, what, where are these guidelines? How do we come up with this? Well, they literally just said it's either a four to six inch incision versus the eight to eight inches back in the day and some sort of quadricep sparing. Quadricep is that thigh muscle in the front of the thigh where the tendon is and the kneecap is, and basically getting into the knee without cutting that. So you can go to the inside, you can go to the outside, and that's sort of the two ways of getting into it without cutting it. Because again, the majority of knee replacements around the country, around the world, are being done by cutting the quadricep tendon. So anywhere, any sparing procedure is good. Well, my definition is not just that, right? That's just like a it's too simple to me. So what my definition is, is it's also not just surgical, but also non-surgical. Like, you know, the type of anesthesia you're going to use that to use a tourniquet, you know, so we'll talk about that. And then of course, the surgical side, the incision, the approach, the retractor, the closure, everything. It's not just like, oh, I, I didn't cut the quad and I'm fine. But yet you were very rough with the tissues, retracting, very rough with the bones and just not careful with your closure you can cause in, in a tremendous insult there. So it's not just the incision, it's not just the approach, it's just everything else. And so the, the minimally invasive, so then no general anesthesia, I think it's huge for me. So I don't use any general anesthesia whenever I can. Uh, so no paralytics, no, no paralyzing the muscle to put a breathing tube. Everything is done with regional blocks. So spinal or block around the knee or the hip, if I do a hip replacement and just some light sedation. So this way they wake up 
feeling refreshed, no post up drowsiness, no nausea, low risk of cardiac pulmonary issues, and then the no tourniquet use. So I don't use a blood pressure cuff at the top of the knee here. I only use it for about 10 minutes or so just for the cementing part, part of it, and it comes down. So that is compared to an hour, an hour and a half, like other knee replacements, it's a very, very minimal uh, time that it's just, uh, and so a lot of my patients come to me and they, they love it. They don't have that bruising that a lot of folks would get. They don't have that weakness. I'm sure Anthony's had many times, many talks about this. And so I think that's really important to me. And, and there's plenty of studies that show that the blood loss is insignificant, has not changed risk of uh, transfusions because we use medications to stop the bleeding. And so it's, it's absolutely safe and you can still see and you can still do anything, everything safely. And so more and more surgeons are adapting this now. Um, so traditional, this is kind of what some of those photos you'll see. This is the tubercle here, the kneecap, this is the top of the thigh. And as you can see somewhere in the distal portion of the, of the, of the, of the lower portion of your thigh bone to sort of the shin bone here. And that's what that eight to 10 inches. And this is an incision that I utilize just at the top of the tubercle here. This is where the knee, the patella tendon attaches. This is your kneecap and just to the, the top of it. And, and this is what my patient looks like. The kneecap somewhere around here and just above it and just right there instead of that middle here to about there. And it's curved because I think it makes sense to me and really not backed up by any data. But again, patients love it. The kneecap is on. Uh, affected, they can kneel on it, they can bend the knee when they do the exercises. So I think that's that's uh, little, little style points that I sort of use and then patients tend to be very happy with it and they don't have a, a scar to kneel on. And so what is the approach that this muscle sparing or this minimally invasive? So the traditional approach is essentially this is the quad muscle, this is the quad tendon, kneecap, patella tendon, and basically coming down on the inside of the kneecap and over and down again. And so basically the one third, because this muscle has one, two, three components, the one third of it is already split. And yes, you repair it, but however, we don't heal 100%. Nothing is 100%. We're about 80 or so percent. And so while many people don't notice this difference at about a year, if you were to quantify that really with science, by looking at nerve conduction or muscle contraction, you'll be able to see that because by science, we don't, we don't heal 100%. So that's by definition, you've just weakened that muscle. I, I don't care how everybody else perceives it. It's, that's the truth. And so and some sort of muscle sparing is basically going underneath it. So you can either go this way and there's a lateral knee approach and go right through the IT band and bring this whole muscle over to the other side. I go to the inside of the knee and bring this whole muscle complex over to the outside of the knee and able to do the approach. And what it looks like is this. This is what that VMO or the vastus medialis or that inside portion of the quad muscle looks like. The quad tendon is here is untouched. This is a kneecap. This is a cadaver study. So I, this is... Uh, not a patient, uh, the incision is not this big and revealing. This is to, to drive the point and you can still see the bone, you can still do the cuts, you can do the cuts here, here, and still do everything you need very, very safely without any issues. And then also we talked about, it's not just the approach of the incision, everything else. So how do you how do you put these retractors? Are you, are you tearing this tissue apart? Or are you being very careful? So I'm constantly just telling folks to just wherever, whoever's helping me, I, I just readjust their hand. I say, I want your hand here. I don't want any more force than this. I, I'm very, very meticulous during my, my surgery. I make sure that I get this excellent hemostasis. What hemostasis means is that you're basically just clotting every little piece of bleeding that you get. You use a special Bovi device to burn them off so that you're not, you don't have a lot of bleeding because hematoma causes swelling, causes pain, causes stiffness. And so you make sure that when you leave the wound, you're not leaving a bleeding uh, vessel or anything. And then just closure, it's very, very important. People don't think about that. And many times, you know, surgeons give this off to their their uh, um, uh, their physical therapy, uh, PA or their um, uh, assistant and whatnot. I, I'm, I'm just very hands-on. And I, just, I think this is very, very important uh, is because you got to have those layers very, very nicely closed, right? You want to have a seal uh, incision, no drainage, and the, the skin has to come together very nicely because the scarring, uh, can be uh, huge and help and uh, hurt them with uh, range of motion afterwards. And so what has what has the literature said about this? You know, there's plenty of studies and they've looked into that. And these are, you know, very good studies, meta-analyses, and, and they've looked at literally what's out there. And they've looked at every single study what's out there, uh, including randomized control trials, which are level one evidence. And so they saw that they did have a better post-op early range of motion. So in the beginning, they were able to move much faster than the ones that had the quad tendon cut. They were able to do a shred leg raise because that quad tendon is intact and strong. So they're able to do that almost right away. 
better pain control, less blood loss. Um, and then at six months, there was a study that looked at, they looked at EMG and nerve conductive studies. They stuck needles in the muscle and they, want, they wanted to see what the contraction was, contraction was. And it was stronger in folks that didn't have a cut versus the ones that did have a cut. But at a year out, you know, what, what studies will show is that it doesn't really make a difference. Patients are just as happy. They feel just as strong. But in the beginning, that's where that benefit comes in. And same thing with hip replacement, the anterior versus posterior. You hear, you hear people talk about and how much faster people bounce. Uh, but at a year out, there's really no difference. So I t- I'll tell folks that I'm, I'm very honest and straightforward for that is that it's at the beginning. It's a great, great help to you. And if I can do the surgery just as safely for you, why won't you take that option? And, and 10 out of 10 times, they're, they're going to say, yes, why wouldn't you not have your quad tenant cut? So I, I offer it to my patients. And so then really briefly, without getting too much into the details and losing folks, is the goal of surgery. So yes, we're going to remove the arthritis, but at the same time, we have to balance this knee. We can't just cut the arthritis, put these metal components and plastic components in and say, okay, have a good day. You know, you have to balance those ligaments if the knee is too loose or rocks or, or it dislocates, God forbid. I mean, that's not a good result. So basically what you see here on the left is basically the knee before or after the surgery. So when you make your cut, you're not just cutting nearly willy the arthritis, you're cutting in such a specific way. We're talking millimeters, we're talking degrees, and you're basically trying to reconstruct this trapezoid or a triangular space and you got to make it into a rectangular space. This is balanced on an extension and it's balanced in flexion. So you went from here to here. So when you make these cuts, they have to be so precise. And again, millimeters and degrees that you have to get this particular uh, box, you know, which is what we call it. These are gaps. We call them gaps and extension gap and flexion gap. These have to be equal. And that's how you get a well-balanced knee. That's how you get these, the tension on the ligaments on the inside and the outside, it needs to be just perfect. That tension has to be, you know, within half a millimeter or a millimeter or so. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's going to feel loose to the patient. So this is where robotics come into play. I mean, this is where, you know, you hear a lot of talk about that. It's because it's just, it, you know, I think surgeons have done a great job for decades uh, putting together a really good knee. Again, how do we maybe lower that 15 to 20% of dissatisfaction? How, how can we get this knee perfectly balanced? And this is exactly what it's showing. You can see here an extension and inflection. We're trying to get that perfect rectangular shape. And, and I don't have some of the numbers beforehand, but we're, we're making these cuts in such a way. We're cutting like 9.5 millimeters over here. And we're cutting one degree of external rotation. And we're giving just a degree or so on, on, the, on the shin bone. And because we want to get this perfect rectangle, 19.5 millimeters, 19.5 millimeters inflection. 19.5 millimeters, 19.5 millimeters. Like you want to get this perfectly balanced. You want these ligaments on the side to be just perfect. And, and then this is where robotics comes to place. And I'm, I'm very, very excited about this technology. I offer it to all my patients now. And it's just, I've already sort of noticed even just intraoperatively the, the difference because it's so precise. And sort of that's what it looks like. Now, there's multiple different kinds uh, of robots that you can use out there. This particular knee that I use uses this robot it's called the Rosa. And you can see some of these markers that we put into the patient's uh, legs. We put one in the shin bone, one in the uh, femur bone. I do the shin bone via two small separate stab incisions. And then the one in the femur or thigh bone, I can put inside the incision. And I don't have to go that much further with my incision. Still keep that small incision. And then this knee is basically calibrated to where your hip is, where your hip center is, where all the landmarks of your thigh bone is, where all the landmarks of the shin bone is, where your ankle is located and sort of three-dimensionally kind of marks everything. You can see here, it sort of moves in with my direction to be just precise to where I need this cutting block to be so I can go ahead and make those perfect cuts and, and have this perfect balancing. So I think that's where the robot really comes into play and it's just fantastic. And so this is a particular patient, right? This patient lost uh, almost 18 degrees from his arthritis, but he could not go straight. And you can only get to about 105 of flexion. So very stiff knee. You know, this is, these are some of those stiffness that are very difficult. So a lot of surgeons who are not uh, fellowship trained have a tough time balancing these knees because they need to know exactly how much to cut and how to cut it in order to get that full flexion, in order to get more, uh, to get that full extension, in order to get more flexion. And look at what the ligaments are doing for this particular patient. So an extension or the knee straight is the gaps. Basically, when I move the knee, it opens up almost six millimeters on the inside. It's three millimeters on the inside. Uh, Inflection is two millimeters, three millimeters. The numbers are all over the place. The ligaments are all over the place. 
the range of motion is really bad. So the robot basically takes all these uh, uh, data point and tells you exactly how to make some of those cuts and you can guide all that and you can check it and it's very nice and this is what after looks like. So before again, he was 18 to 105. After surgery, he goes now to zero, which is right here. And he goes to just with gravity, he was 138, you know, almost 140 without me pushing on it. It was already there. And then before you can see here, again, those numbers were five, five, three, two, three. And look, look at what the robot is able to do now. He's getting a millimeter because you want to give, you don't want zero, right? That's tight. No one's going to love that knee. It's, it's, you need a millimeter of give, a push. That's what our, our normal ligaments have. And so basically this patient is now balanced to a millimeter and inflection is half a millimeter, which again, uh, no one ever would, would know that or, or be able to tell that. It's just the robot tells you that, but that is just like excellent. And I will tell you from even my personal experience how I inflection is really where I had a hard time without the robot really quantifying it. What's what's really balanced, what's not. And, and a lot of times was this kind of good enough attitude. And yeah, that's good enough. That works really well. Okay, okay. But now you have a robot that says, no, no, look, you can get it perfect. You can get to that precision of 0.5 millimeters. So why wouldn't you offer that to your patient? So it's fantastic. And, and all that, all those cuts, everything else. And again, this may not mean much to people, but basically the bearing thickness up here is 10 millimeters. This is the smallest plastic you can put into a patient with this particular model that I use, the Smith & Nephew Zimmer Knee. I'm sorry, not Smith & Nephew, the Zimmer Knee. This is the smallest uh, plastic you can put in basically those that's why sometimes I have folks that say, why, why does my one knee have so much space in between the bones and why does it? It's because they had to cut so much differently and have to put a bigger plastic. I can put the smallest plastic and get those precise numbers because that's how, how precise the robot is. And so I think that's, uh, that's what the, what's exciting about this. And then the postoperative phase. So they start physical therapy right away, twice in the hospital before they go home. They get excellent pain control. I don't just do narcotics. I do a multitude of other medications, which address their pain amazingly. I have some folks for almost 48 hours not to feel any pain. I have a total joint nurse who understands this patient, around on this patient. Um, there's no waiting for home health or physical therapy. It's all being set up. It's all being done for them to know exactly when to go see a physical therapist so they can start their range of motion. And then I, I talk to my patients over the phone. I let them know how they're doing. They call me, reach out to me anytime they want to. They have my cell phone. So I think all that together makes it, I'm sort of their biggest fan. I cheer them on and they kind of, they, they show me videos, they show me how they're, they tell me how they're doing. So that's, that's important. And, and so this is, this is a patient of mine, four hours after surgery, uh, essentially just uh, lifting up the walker. This is a, he's actually a fan of uh, Anthony. He's, he follows his YouTube channel. He told me that he told me that he saw me online. So, and this is him basically had the right side done, lifting up the uh, walker and just walking out of there dressed to go home uh, four hours after surgery. Um, and this other patient of mine in a hospital gown after surgery, uh, up and going, as soon as the spinal was worn off so her muscles could fire again, uh, this is basically her going and just moving their knee. At, this is like 90, 95 degrees of just having surgery with a hematoma and everything else that happens. This is her in a hospital gown doing that. So uh, I think there's, there's uh, uh, great value into doing that. And so best, best advice I can give my patients, you know, the best change I'm having is done, hip or knee, is to get it done right the first time. I do revision surgery all the time. I'm also training that. And so I do it all the time. I think I provide a very good revision knee. However, it's not as good as a, a, a original knee replacement. There's a lot of compromises there. And this is the time to not have any compromise to get the perfect knee. So while I talk about millimeter invasive, I talk about robotics. You know, I think excellent surgeon is number one. So you need to find an excellent surgeon first. And, and then that's, that's what's really important. And then if he has to be able to do some of this MIS and offer those to you, that's sort of cherry on top. And so do your research, get second opinion, see where, how your surgeon's trained and see what kind of training they have, what kind of background. And it's nice to go to them with questions. You know, it shows you're an educated patient and, you know, you want what's best for you, your best advocate. So do that. And so this is, again, my information. I'm available. Uh, people can sometimes send me emails for questions. I, I certainly do telemedicine. We've been able to uh, reach some folks actually um, outside state lines here. And, and after seeing some of these videos and calling me and setting up some telemedicine, so I'm, I'm happy to provide that. And of course, our websites are full of, uh, full of uh, knowledge and full of uh, materials and source for you to uh, educate yourself. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. That was incredible.
Like that was so great. We had a couple questions that came in and then I just have a brief question. I want to be mindful mm -hmm. of your time. You're good. So on the YouTube channel, there was a question related to um, the injections done before the knee replacement. And I know, you know, her quote was they called it a rooster booster. So is that the injection that you were talking about, the um, coxcomb that they use? Could you just mention that briefly? Yeah, that's, you know, a lot of the layman's terms, uh, the rooster comb or all that is essentially basically gel. Uh, hyaluronic acid is the component, the chemical component of it. If you were to look at and Google what cartilage is made of, it has this very strong backbone of hyaluronic acid. And so people thought that maybe injecting components of cartilage into a gel form could potentially help that and repair. It, it doesn't, it doesn't regenerate, it doesn't repair, it doesn't use as nutrition or anything like that. It really is just gel material. You've seen that. Right. And it's essentially just depositing this very nice smooth, but eventually with time that breaks down and your body sort of has a way of getting something that's foreign. It doesn't belong there out of there. And so it gets broken up as, as a, cause it's a foreign material, but I, I have patients that really like it. Uh, and I have patients that didn't really like it and actually made them worse at times because it's su such a thick material and our joint is such a tight space that you're putting anything extra that stays there for a while. It really causes tremendous pain. So, um, but that is what that, that patient is referring to. Uh, and I, sometimes I care, I don't often carry them. I have to sort of order them for patients. Some people I even order them from out of the country and then I administer it to them uh, because insurance sometimes doesn't cover them. It's too high cost for them. And another question that came in, which I've heard a lot is related to restless leg syndrome. And so she was asking if this was considered part of the arthritic pain before surgery, why, if you have any information about why somebody develops restless leg following surgery, I know it's a common patient complaint, difficulty sleeping associated with restless leg. What do you have about that? Yeah. So, um, I do have some patients sometimes that tell me, number one, I'm having a hard time sleeping. My restless leg is getting worse. And, and, and so it's, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm, I'm a little up to speed with some of this topic because my wife is a sleep medicine physician. So she deals with sleep apnea and she deals with issues with sleeping. She deals with restless legs. So her and I sort of talk about that. And so, yes, my surgery, my knee replacement can make the restless leg worse. Um, and what I do, some of the, one of the medications I do give to my patients for pain is actually gabapentin. It's part of the regimen. And I tend for those folks, I double it for them. And uh, gabapentin is a sort of a nerve pain medication that also can be sedating to patients. That's why I give it to them at night. So that it doesn't affect their daily activities or physical therapy and make them groggy. So sometimes I give them at night, which absolutely addresses that as well. Uh, anemia is actually a cause of restless legs. So some surgeons will actually uh, check or surgeons, the doctors will actually check for ferritin, which is sort of a, a level of your iron and everything else. So when they become anemic after surgery, which, which happens, obviously, uh, it can worsen their restless leg. And that's one of the biggest uh, things that we tell folks to check it again, get on some iron supplementation. Again, most folks can handle it. Most folks that don't have restless leg, most folks that don't have heart disease can handle a little bit of a blood loss. It's about two to 300 cc's. But some folks that can't, this transit anemia, this temporary anemia while their blood count comes up again, it affects their, um, it affects their restless leg. It makes it worse, actually. And this is something that I also recently uh, found out. So, because one of my patients was referred to her and that's what they talked about. They got ferritin, they got them on iron supplementation, they introduced the gabapentin it sort of helped him out uh, tremendously. So um, uh, that's one of the reasons, but yes, uh, a replacement can make the restless leg worse. And, you know, it, it should be temporary. It should go back to their usual baseline once their anemia is up to speed and some of these medications will help with that, but it can make it worse for sure. How long do you typically expect the short-term anemia to be an issue? How, because uh, this is something that I'm shocked. I had no idea that that contributed to the sensation of the restless leg. I talk about it because patients are always so surprised at how quickly they fatigue in therapy at home. And we talk about anemia. What's yeah. the typical time frame if they don't go out and get supplementation or an infusion? When can they expect? I mean, I, I, unfortunately, we're doing this in older folks, which have either medication that suppress their bone marrow or their bone marrow is com almost completely gone or trying to kind of get into those later stages of life. They're not as, you know, as quickly pro producing like they used to. So, so unfortunately, it does take time for my elderly patient, which is what, what my patients are, 
to, to bounce back. And, I, and there's a feeling of fatigue and I can't get through physical therapy. I, I hear it. I hear it as well. And um, I would say probably like half a year or so, six months or so. And wow. I would say, look, you know, if you can, obviously causes constipation, but iron supplementation is always a good idea. Um, it's not very common, right? I mean, I, I, I want to at least throw that out there. It's not very common. I think fortunately or unfortunately, we're sort of heading towards having the surgery done sooner, earlier and earlier. So back in the day it was 70s and 80s, and now we're seeing very much so in the 60s. Really, that's sort of the, 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 the time for the majority of my patients are in their 60s now. And and those folks don't mind it as much, and they get to bounce right back. But some of the older, elderly folks in the 70s and 80s are tremendously hit by this. And and so it just it can take half a year or so for them to sort of gain back their strength, gain back their stamina. This is a hit to them, I tell them. I, I try to hit them as, li- as little as I can by avoiding general anesthesia because that can cause cognitive issues and, and you know cognitive function. And so I try to make it as safe as I can. But at the end of the day, this is still stress on your body. There's still a hit on your body. This is still a, a take back and you have to now physical therapy get forward to where you were so people can sort of downside, downgrade from a no walker to now walker or, or a cane or no cane. Again, most of my patients sort of recover. You can see them. They're, they're doing so well with the minimally invasive stuff. But for sure, there's, there's folks, this is big surgery, as little as we make this sound. And I joke around and I say minimally invasive. What really is minimally invasive is a knee scope or a lab, lab coli, someone taking your coli or your, or your appendix via a tiny little puncture hole in your belly. That, that really is minimally invasive. Sure. Uh, this is a big surgery and no, no, um, uh, no, no hiding behind that. Uh, it's just that we're trying to make it as safe and, and as small as we can for you and as precise as we can for you. Wow. Okay. My last question. I mean, I've got a page of notes that I took, but yeah. I'm genuinely curious. I think the greatest thing about the YouTube channel and reaching out and this kind of information is that we get to touch so many lives, both within the U.S., outside the U.S. And so I know the question that's on people's mind, because this has been on my mind lately. How would you recommend that somebody truly chooses the right surgeon for their particular case because we're so used to the medical model in which you go to the doctor whoever the doctor is you show up and they treat you but i think now the world is shrinking we have access to more providers and we can actually choose somebody can watch this hear your story look at what you do and say that's the surgeon that i want when you're advising somebody else to choose the right surgeon for this procedure, what are some of the things that you would be looking for if it was your mom, your dad, your wife, somebody related to you? Yeah, and, and uh, so the second opinion is one of the points that I touched in my last slide there. And I, and I sort of tell them, this is a big commitment. You don't, you don't buy the first house you see and you don't buy the first car you test drive. You, you, you check out a few and, and seeing a couple surgeons, it's, it's really important. It, it has to... A lot of my, because I get second opinions, right? They come to me and they've either listened to this or they hear about me and they come to me and say, hey, I have a scheduled surgery on so-and-so. I wanted to see kind of what you had to say. And they 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 had to feel a connection. It's weird. I, I'm not trying to make this about an emotional thing, but it, it really is that because they're trusting your life and they have to say like, I, so there's a little bit of that. And of course, with masks on and those sort of things, it's kind of getting a little hard and difficult, but they have to to look at the, the, the doctor and, and, and how are they explaining things? Are, are, is confidence coming across that they know what they're doing? And, 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 and are they taking their time with me? And a lot, that's what I hear a lot. Like they just do not take the time to explain. Like, and a lot of them like, well, no one has really ever showed me my x-rays. They just said, you have arthritis, you need a new replacement, book it or not. Or, you know, you are overweight, I can't help you. And you know, like, there's ways of just saying the same thing, right? There's ways of getting that message across that can make the patient inclusive. That's why everything's patient center. So, so having that conversation with them that really took their time, really let them know, like, why are we doing what we're doing? Right. I, I know that, you know, what you're doing doctor, but I need you to kind of explain to me, why are we doing what we're doing? Why am I doing the surgery to you? Why? It's not just the arthritis, it's the balancing. And, and I do this surgery stuff because I want to, I want to hurt you less. And so they hear that and they're like, Oh, wow, that's great. You know? And like I said, I, and I'm biased. I'm fellowship trained. I think, you know, other, other surgeons can do a fantastic job and depending what their training is, because some surgeons are better than others. Uh, but I just, you know, do the research, see what they were trained, see what kind of training they have, because complications happen. And I think in my opinion, if that was me and my surgeon, now something happened, I had a, a complication and complications happen, happen to me, happen to anybody, infections, breaking, fractures, loosening, whatever, hip dislocations, all that. It, you know, if, if a surgeon tells you he's never had those, he's either lying or hasn't operated long enough to have those. And so 
I, what's going to happen when that happens? Right? Am I going to call a, a number that I can't reach you? No, here's my cell phone number. You can call me right away because I'm not hiding behind a number. I'm, I'm, I'm there for you to call me. I did a great job, and I'm there for you to call me. Doctor, this happened. I'm very frustrated with it. And then can they help you? Can they help you with the next step? Is Can they help you with the revision, or they're just going to send you off somewhere else? And I think I think that's important because a lot of patients, just, they, feel, they have that feeling of abandonment. Like they, my surgeon did my surgery, but that he can't fix it now. So why did he do my surgery, right? So do your research, see who your surgeon is, what kind of experience they have. And, and again, careful in the experience because the 800 or 1000 joint guy, it's not going to spend that time in the upper room to do your knee. It's just what it is. Just, there's not enough hours in the day to do that. So just because somebody is, is busy and, and it's doing a thousand joints with multiple rooms, they're not going to give you that, uh, that time of what you need to have that need done from, from, from incision to closure to afterwards to be in there for you and all that. So I think that, that, that's important. So you have to be careful with that. Uh, and so that's what I do. I, my goal is to treat patients, not to be the busy surgeon in town, is to do whatever cases I do, to do them really, really well and have that excellent reputation. And I think that, and you can tell that some patients are smart enough to sort of tease that out if they're, if they're the guy that, you know, has all this stuff and a lot of fanfare, fanfare and a flair about them. They, they, can, they can work through that. But yeah, background, sitting down with them, looking at them eye to eye and say, how are you going to do the surgery? What's going to happen? What's my recovery? And if they're addressing your questions, they're there for you. Uh, you, you can see that connection. And I think they can go ahead and, and choose that surgeon for their surgery. And that's sort of what I tell them. Yeah. Wow. That's so wonderful. And again, thank you so much. Do me a favor. Just sure. stick around while I wrap up this live stream. Mm -hmm. Guys, anybody who wants to reach out to Dr. Florian, I'll put his website, his social media, his contact information in the description of this video right below. This was such an enormous opportunity. I mean, just think about the value that's been shared in over 45 minutes of time here. So once again, thank you from myself. Thank you from the community and stay right where you are. We'll wrap this up.